We are here today to talk very specifically about how culture can empower women. I would say that is not a topic that has been broadly on the WEF agenda until very recently. These four women have, these four incredible leaders have put it on the WEF agenda. And in my mind, when you put something on the WEF agenda, you're putting it on the agenda of the world's most prominent world leaders and business leaders. So well done. Let me take a second and tell you who they are and we'll get right into it. Shoshana Stewart is the CEO of Turquoise Mountain. I marveled that she became CEO when she was 28 years old. If you haven't heard of Turquoise Mountain, it is an amazing charity that basically empowers women by giving them work through artisanship. And you're working in Afghanistan, Jordan, yep. Saudi Arabia, and Myanmar, I think. So, so happy to have you here. We have Molly Fannin, who I keep wanting to call Molly Shannon, <laughs> who is the Director of International Relations at the Smithsonian. Um, and also in charge of global programs. I want to say she is the one responsible for bringing culture as a means of economic empowerment to Davos, so well done and thank you. And she went to my college, so I have special affection for her. <laughs> Nadia Swarovski needs almost no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. You had a fabulous film and dinner last night, for those of us who were there. Really well done. She is on the executive board of Swarovski, her family's business. And I was trying to figure out either the fourth or fifth generation. Fifth generation, New York Times is also on fifth generation family leadership. Yes, oh, oh, yes, well, well done. We'll have to get you guys together. She is, um, yeah, I'll have somebody grab them if you don't mind, thank you. She is um, also very involved in this community of empowering people and women, people in the developing world through culture. Um, and her day job is she's in charge of communications and branding for Swarovski. And I want to say she's the one who put it back on the map um, as a fashion brand. So well done. And then I am so, so happy to have Pippa Small here. I'm going to call on her first. Pippa also needs no introduction. She is an amazing jewelry designer, if you didn't already guess that, um, <laughs> by what you're wearing. I just have to brag that the CEO of Cartier in North America is in the room, and I said, you're especially going to love this panel. Um, Pippa, as I understand, is now being worn uh, by, uh, by the Duchess, so the one we're all following uh, most closely, so well done on that, and has collaborated with all of these guys, and you describe yourself as an ethical jeweler, and you're a trained anthropologist, so bring quite a bit to the table. So I, I want to start um, with a very big question, then we'll do a little more background from you all about what you're doing here, which is why in a world that is facing so many crises, terrorism, um, all sorts of humanitarian crises, the rising inequality climate, why spend any time at all or resources on culture. Um, Pippa, I'm gonna go to you first and just ask you, because I know you have to leave us a little bit early, ask you to comment on that, which means we should give you a mic. Thank you. Um, okay, culture and women. I mean, culture obviously is at the heart of everything. I mean, that's... And I'm gonna say, hold your mic close. Closer, so people okay. Um, culture being at the heart of everything, good and bad. Um, in taking, taking an example of how intangible culture, cultural heritage, um, inspires a sense of cohesion, a sense of um, identity, a sense of purpose, something that's so absolutely vital, especially in um, vulnerable areas of conflict or post-conflict. It's, it's the most important thing in a way to invest in because it's something that gives, in, in the context of artisans, which is where I'm coming from, it gives people, um, women, job opportunity, first and foremost, which of course brings self-confidence, brings uh, financial independence. And secondly, it's a kind of, it's an area to kind of protect those who are vulnerable to sort of dangerous messaging. It's an area of investing in people who are gonna bring about change because these artisans, although making things, they have jobs they're gonna contribute. They're the ones who have a sense of hope in their community because creating is about hope. It's about optimism, it's about change. So. To me, it's like, it's so utterly fundamental. It's almost inarticulatable because it's so important. It's so vital. 
So I love that notion that culture is a form of protection. That's not necessarily a way people thought about it. Molly, I want to ask you, because this is what you do for a living, your work spans some of the crises that we think of um, more often, like terrorism and climate and so forth, biodiversity and culture. Why do anything at all there? So it's a great question. I mean, when you think about the disasters that face our world, why would anyone invest in something like a museum when you have real problems, lack of water, lack of medicine, lack of economic opportunities? And I came from the international development sphere. I didn't come from a museum sphere. And I think the, the reality is that we as a cultural sector need to understand the intrinsic value culture has for holding memory of people, right? The, the reason that ISIS destroys culture, first and foremost, as Milan Hubel wrote, is the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, right? So the, it, it holds our identity. And if you want to bring a society to its knees, that's what you target. There has, there's, there's so much intrinsic value that that's what you target. But then we as cultural sector need to be able to link the intrinsic value it has to the real world issues that are normally on the agenda at the World Economic Forum. So when I traveled to Geneva a few years ago to kick off this partnership between the Smithsonian and the Forum, or hopefully kick off this partnership, the way I talked about culture wasn't necessarily about its beauty and its aesthetic and the way it can make us feel human, which is all really the end game of why we're all in it. It was language is disappearing. Language is culture, right? Indigenous languages are disappearing. Those indigenous languages that are all predicted 90% to disappear in the next 100 years aren't just valuable for their intrinsic value. They contain knowledge about the biodiversity of our planet, about traditions, about future innovations that might save our world. After oil, it was the trafficking, the illicit trafficking in cultural heritage that was the second largest source of revenue for ISIS. The wow. people who traffic in cultural heritage are the same criminal networks that traffic in wildlife, that traffic in arms, and the traffic in humans. So when we work with the World Customs Organization, and we train customs organizations and Ju Department of Justice and FBI at the Smithsonian, it's not because it's a cute cottage industry culture. It's because if you want to get the bad guys, this is another avenue to do it. Um, so, so my role at the Smithsonian really is to be the person who cares deeply about the mission of the Smithsonian, which is the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. I mean, how great is it to work for an organization like that? But to then pivot and translate the so what of that to other organizations like the WEF. So the WEF had been doing a phenomenal job bringing arts and culture to the center of the forum long before the Smithsonian got involved. I think we have been co-conspirators, the, the WEF's team on this, to just amp it up a bit. And we're so thrilled that we've done it even more this year. Last year we had the tree, if you guys were here. Yeah. This year we have in the loft this whole exhibition that tells the story of what Turquoise Mountain um, is doing that we are so, we, we so admire, yeah. So, so I love that end note because it's fundamentally about women coming, women leaders coming together to empower one another. Shoshana, I want you to talk about three of the four, the, three of the five of us sitting up here are kind of in this together. Talk about how the partnership, the loft came to be and how you all are connected to one another. Perfect, thank you. Hold your mic close. Very good, here we are. Um, so, my name's Shoshana. Hello, everybody. Um, so, I met Pippa in 2008 in Kabul, and she's been back and forth a squillion times designing lines of jewelry and now with us in Myanmar. Uh, and Molly and I met a few years ago. So, this collaboration started when the Smithsonian and the Freer and Sackler Galleries, in particular, brought an exhibition called Turquoise Mountain Artists Transforming Afghanistan to the Smithsonian in Washington. And... Uh, I did not see it coming. I mean, I was so excited to get the exhibition, and of course we want to be on display in Washington, and I just didn't know what was gonna happen, but it sounded great. What I didn't expect is that 400,000 people came to see this exhibition, and they loved it, and it meant something to them. And it's sort of, why? I mean, you, you come in, and it's in some ways a very traditional narrative of Afghanistan. You have bombs, the Russians, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, then you enter a very quiet, beautiful space and you experience Afghanistan through five individuals, five artisans, five traditions, uh, five media, 
uh, woodworking, calligraphy and painting, jewelry, ceramics, and carpets. Uh, and it is a more textured, human, beautiful experience with this country, which apparently all those 400,000 people, some of them will, will have known people or they themselves served in Afghanistan, but other people just have a difficult relationship with this country, with Muslims, with refugees, with all these things. So that was amazing, and that is how that was our first experience together, which uh, has then then grown into what you see if you come and visit us in the loft, which is an expansion of that to collaborations across countries. So in all the countries in which we work now, so Myanmar and also in bits of the Middle East. So we have uh, a Saudi plaster carver there, and we also work in Jordan. Um, and so Pippa is there with uh, one of her partners in crime in Myanmar, Tin Win, who is a goldsmith from Rakhine. And the two of them are sitting there and, and, and making and talking about their collaboration. Uh, and so we're and, on the other side of the Congress Center, if anyone wants to come. And just say what you said to me a minute ago that about how we can all experience it. Like, we can make two, right? Yes. You, you can go and throw a pot. You can go and learn how to cut metal, uh, as Tin Win does. You can learn how to carve plaster, carve woodwork. It is meant to be an interaction between artisans, designers, but but people and uh, and our artisans. It's amazing. So I'm going to come, Nadia. I'm going to come to you in a moment um, on a similar topic. But Pippa, I want to ask you. You, I, I read a lot about you and what you've chosen to do. And you've collaborated with Chloe and Tom Ford and Nicole Fari, and you could have this very commercial business. And it seems that you choose not to, that you choose to direct your effort here. I want to understand, is that, are, are there moments where that's a struggle, where you think if I did this in a different way, I, I could do even more, or I could live in a different way? Like, talk, talk about that. Um, Never. We all think about, and I'll, I'll use the words, we all think about, like, how do you translate success, success to significance? You're doing that in real time. Thank you. <laughs> it's very kind. Um, no, I never think about how it could be different. I mean, to me, the um, I came to jewelry accidentally. I studied anthropology. I was kind of on a on a sort of path in human rights, and I was kind of set to do something else. And jewelry is something that I've always loved. Stones. I've been interested in the sort of symbolic value of jewelry, but. Working when I started to, to decided to commit to doing jewelry and opened a shop and started consulting with other brands, I had this sort of thought that if I was going to do this, I would only do it if I could kind of create this new path, which is start working with communities that I'd worked with previously in a kind of more research based way, but to start doing it as an income generating. So, I mean, I'm yeah. quite pragmatic, it's about sort of something I started maybe 15 years ago with the Bushmen in Botswana. Um, it was about working with different groups finding their traditional skills, their resources, the materials they use, and then kind of translating it. It's a sort of strange role of being a, a bridge from <clears throat> one culture into another because, unfortunately, the markets are in the West. So if, especially something like jewelry, there are limited local markets, but generally if people want sustainable work, we have to take the work out. So this role of kind of tra translating very traditional heritage jewelry into something that's got a an essence of the voice of the hand of the experience, the soul of the craftspeople, the artisans who we work with, but it's going to be for sale in, in New York, in Barney's or in Netaporte, but probably losing its story along the way. Very hard to kind of control that the message goes with it, but what we hope is that the piece itself will carry through the, through the design, through the energy of the workers, it will carry something of that place. And so it's a kind of it's an interesting and fascinating role because in the end, it's like sitting down in different environments, whether it's a slum area in Kibera, Nairobi, or in, in Kabul with the, the craftspeople there. And you learn the life stories of these artisans, whether it's men or women, but from their experiences of motherhood or their experiences and challenges in a war zone or whatever it happens to be. And it's so fulfilling. It's so fascinating. It's such an incredible privilege that I would have no other way. <laughs> I think we all feel professional envy for you right now to, to follow your passion that way. Nadia, I want to ask you, um, we're in a moment where, just as you described, Pippa, the world is so much more interested in artisanship and the ingredients and the, the manner in which something is made. How does that, I'm gonna ask you a commercial question then I wanna ask about some of your philanthropic work. How does that 
play out that interest in how was this brought to me in a market? You're running a massive business and a very big and important and successful commercial brand. How do you think about artisanship? Well, you know, I think uh, consumerism has just taken over. And I think, you know, it had really kind of started, it was very apparent when brands started to replicate their stores in various different locations. Yep. Pull your mic closer. To which you. was no more motivation for people to go shopping in various different destinations because you can see the same X store in London as in Madrid as in LA and so on. And actually realizing there are so many wonderful characteristics for these various different locations. I think this is um, what really... Um, triggered a, a, a counter reaction within the consumer and also the fact that uh, a communication has increased so much with the digitalization you know people are realizing there's so much more out there and they're yearning individualism via finding bespoke or individual elements um, we in terms of Swarovski we think first of all we're here to empower women with the jewelry. It makes them feel in a certain way you know it has a purpose but the other purpose also is a uh, the meaning that the jewelry carries. And um, I was just saying earlier at another panel, we, can, we must never underestimate the intelligence of the consumer to un actually understand what things are made of, where they come from, who the creator is behind it. And that actually adds the meaning to a jewelry piece, for example, to a consumer. And it's a talking point. And we see that ever so often, you know, we work with fashion designers to create our jewelry. Um, and often we have customers who actually can't afford the fashion pieces. You know, so I've had customers come up to me thanking me for creating a Victor and Rolf ring because they cannot afford the dress, but now they have a bit of them by having the ring. So that is amazing that we're able to bring that kind of brand or artisanship yeah. to the consumer. So, so you're, you're making me think of another question, which is um, to what degree is technology sort of enabling this moment? You can Pippa, Shoshana... Uh, Molly, like you can now get culture to more people. Obviously, you can make them mm -hmm. more aware, but your design, you know, a, a woman in Afghanistan can work with a woman in Jordan and somebody in New York can walk into Barney's and buy that. What's the point we're at in that and what more should we expect to see? Shoshana, I mean, this is what you do for a living. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a ten, 10 different ways to answer it. So I'll, I'll pick one. Um, so, it, of course, brings people closer, and that is fundamental for incomes and for empowerment of women, that the artisan is closer to the consumer. That the closer they can get on designing and finishing pieces, the more the value is kept with them and, and in the country. Um, but technology doesn't reach as far as one thinks to rural Afghanistan, actually. I mean, yes, everybody's got a mobile phone, but there are lots of sort of funny things going on with tablets in the NWFP that... that have trouble connecting or whatever else. I mean, there are, there are, we don't understand it fully is what I often feel. Um, but the ways that it, it has been really cool. So we we're Google street viewing the old city of Kabul right now because nobody's going to the old city of Kabul. I mean, we're making a tourist destination and you're all very welcome, but I think it might be another decade before any of you come. Um, but we want to bring the old city of Kabul and actually little alleys of information to access these intangible traditions as well via the internet. So you can do these things, but then you've got to drive people to it. And you've got to, you know, I mean, consumerism is, is this fundamental massive thing in our lives and people do want to consume it. They want to buy it. And so that works for Sayida the jeweler if you can make sure that you help her create content that tells her story and that she's got a distributor and that she is in Pippa's shop with Pippa in LA and New York and London. So, so let me ask specifically, Pippa, how's this empowering to women? Uh, how's it empowering to women? It's, um, it's so hugely important to women. I mean, I was saying with Shoshana yesterday that one of the things that astounds me about the um, Afghan artisans, women artisans, is their sense of ambition. They're kind of, when, when I talk to, to some of the graduates or students, it's not that they want to be a jewelry designer. It's like they want to be the best jewelry designer in the world. I mean, that's how strong their desire to be heard and seen and for their, the value in their work to be appreciated. And that's something quite extraordinary to see. It's also, I mean, just as an aside, there's something I was thinking about, about the value of space and in Kabul, which is, 
um, a city that is kind of, in some sense, a version of hell, because everywhere you look, there's barbed wire, there's massive walls, there's tanks, machine guns. It's an environment that I imagine for girls and women to, to be going about their daily lives extremely stressful. It's a kind of unimaginable daily life there. Yeah. But when they come to um, the institute that Turquoise Mountain has um, created in the old city, it's like walking into a kind of heaven. It's like this beautiful earth architecture, traditional structure that's full of kind of calligraphy painted on the walls. It's pomegranate trees and courtyards. It's like the sense of beauty and peace and calm. And in that environment where boys and girls, men and women are working together, they're creating something beautiful. And it's sort of, it's hard to, to see the value of that kind of peace for people who have to live daily with a sort of unimaginable tension. So, but so keep keep going, please. No. I didn't. Want to, I, I thought so. Nadia, I want to ask you to comment on that as well because you're a UN ambassador for women, mm -hmm. and you particularly work with women who've experienced war um, in their country or their community. Talk about the role of beautiful things and design. Well, I just have to comment to that very quickly. It's so lovely. It seems like such an amazing escape it actually to is, the yeah. true <laughs> reality, mm. to true life. You know, and I think people are truly themselves if they are able to channel their creative energy, mm. you know? Mm. So it's amazing what you're offering. These people are so <laughs> lucky, really incredible. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, it's it's amazing. To, we work very closely with Women for Women, for example, and it's amazing to see the little financial contribution makes such a huge difference to these women to really regain, as you were mentioning earlier, their self-confidence by uh, making a difference, having a purpose, um, being in control financially yeah. of their families, and um, having success, you know? And then that's an upward spiraling staircase. So, so Molly, you, you've been doing this work for quite some time. Talk about what, um, what this sort of artisanship does in terms of busting through traditional gender roles, maybe even shifting power in some of these communities. So I want... Um Shoshana talk about a very specific example of that, but I think it's it's important to know when I when I speak about like the utilitarianism of culture, mm -hmm. we speak about that in a way because it's a way to get people to pay attention. So there's a there's a basic fact that in most developing countries, after agriculture, artists and craft is the single largest employer of people, and that's particularly true of women. So when organizations take it seriously and look at the market seriously, and when you think about it the way Turquoise Mountain thinks about it, it it can be a massive uplift for women in terms of in terms of power. We've also found recently um, at the Smithsonian, we just opened the African American Museum. It's been about a year. It's been a wild ride in the United States for the last year. You guys know that, but there's been this place now in the United States on the National Mall where we are openly talking about what has been a massive fracture in our society, like race, right? Yep. And we're seeing now that in other countries where we work, in Bosnia, in Colombia, in other places where people have been through really trying times of crisis and conflict, and probably very soon in Mosul, that it's the creation of museums or other cultural institutions that can tell a national narrative that women are a part of, and the actual, the curation and the storytelling and the interpretation of those stories, whether through artists and craft and traditions or through stories, is a way, it's a real way of bringing people together. And so you see a, a major example of that right now in the National Mall, but you're gonna see it soon in Bosnia where they're gonna be reopening their National Museum. You're gonna be seeing it soon in Colombia where they're opening a Museum of Peace and Reconciliation. That, that these cultural sites are not just nice things to have for the privileged. They're, they're essential institutions um, for a more hopeful world. And, and, but, I, but I would love for Shoshana to speak about one individual who I think you can come and meet in our loft who has changed her own dynamic. Yeah. Hanan. <laughs> so, um, yes, there's a, it, it's, it's nice to talk about the individuals. So, uh, Hanan is uh, a woman from Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah, and she is a wonderful plaster carver, though this is a relatively new skill for her, actually. It wasn't passed down her family. Um, we work with a lot of Saudi hotels, the Four Seasons, the Fairmont, the Radisson, to produce products from across our artisan network, and we end, have ended up working with quite a lot of Saudi artisans also. So 
we started doing gypsum cl uh, carved plaster work, which is very traditional in Jeddah, and they got a commission for, we got a commission for 300 pieces over six months, which was wonderful. And uh, it was completed, they're all handmade and wonderful. Then the Fairmont, sorry, the Marriott came and said, those are lovely, maybe we have 700 of them in three months. And we thought, oh, great, okay, yes, of course you can, wonderful. So we got Hanan and 20 of her fellow uh, plaster carvers and figured out how we are going to produce three times as much in half the time. Uh, and they've now made a molding process, they're hand finishing everything. But this is a serious manufacturing question. Uh, and Hanan is seven months pregnant and before she jumped on the plane from Jeddah, uh, earlier last week, she concluded their seventy thousand dollar commission for the Marriott Hotel. Um, you know, she's a serious, she's a serious now teacher and businesswoman, um, and I guess that's what it looks like. Um, and just to loop back to the first question, which I loved, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> why do we do culture? Why, why does it matter? And all this. Um, I, so, if you look at a, a woman, particularly in a, in a difficult position. Uh, Becoming a tech entrepreneur or a craft entrepreneur, both give you financial power, you're managing people, a lot of amazing things. One thing is that uh, because crafts are more traditionally uh, acceptable for women, you got less of a barrier en to entry there, so that's useful. But the cool thing is that for Hanan or for Samira in Afghanistan or Saida, who I mentioned earlier, they are then creating products which embody a sense of pride in everyone around them. Right? So you get all these men and you get all these ministers coming through and they're like, this is my culture. This is Afghan culture. This is Saudi culture. And they're so proud. And it's being done by a woman. It's being pushed out into the world by a woman. And not a woman doing a cute little cottage industry. A woman who's running a business and is like, actually, you need to go because I need to finish this for my deadline next week. Um, and I, th I think that is very powerful that it comes. It's not just a job. It is about a sense of identity and pride. That's amazing. I want to ask you all three to comment on how does this move governments? How does it move political systems? Like where, where you know, how do you get from, wow, the man knows that the woman made the product that made him feel good to be from a particular community in Afghanistan to changing laws? Does it go there? It is. It's going there. I think we have a ways for it to go in the United States, actually. Um, Talk about that. Okay, but let me first reference um, another place. So I think that the more that you can show the pride that culture generates, we're working in Armenia, where because of pressures of, of globalization, there are very few job opportunities in the, the villages that are outside of Yerevan, right? And so people are leaving. And the tradition bearers that know how to write to bake lavash bread, I, was, I said write because my writer is right here who did a beautiful piece on the, the cultural heritage of baking lavash in Armenia. Um, all of those tradition bearers are having to leave the place of their tradition and go to Yerevan and have jobs that possibly have less meaning to them. And we're working in Armenia to shift the paradigm of how to think about development with USAID and an experimental program um, to first do research in cultural heritage, and it's research being led by Armenian scholars working with the Smithsonian, and Rebecca, who's sitting here, is coordinating all that research, and then embedding that research into really, really rich cultural heritage tourism programming and marketing for Armenia. So now, you're not gonna just go to Yerevan and spend a day in Yerevan, you're gonna go out and, and spend time in the villages. That's the hypothesis, and I really think we're gonna get there in the next couple of years. And it's a proof of concept so that we can then take it to other places. And it's my feeling that as the world's largest museum and cultural and research in, institution in you know the world's largest, we have a responsibility as an organization not just to exhibit cultures around the world, but to help sustain them. And we have to be practical about it. And that means linking it to economic development. And so we're, we're doing that quite bluntly. And I think we can achieve the, the sustainability of culture by recognizing its importance in pride and its importance in um, agency and its importance in, in a counter narrative. Right after the earthquake in Haiti, and then I will get to the States, I promise. Um, USAID invested hundreds of millions of dollars in Haiti in water and sanitation and in rescuing people. And 
they gave us a little bit of money to do a project to save the cultural heritage of Haiti that my colleague Richard Kieran did. The Minister of Culture of Haiti at the time said, after saving people's lives, the next most important thing to save is their reason for living. Ten years later, almost, uh, I'm going to get my dates wrong, the, in reflection on all of the money that's been spent in Haiti, the one element of USAID's investment, according to the former um, administrator of USAID, was that very small program because it told a counter-narrative of your culture and your contribution to the global community is so important that we're going to help you save it. It's so critical. So I really think that in the United States, for example, some of our cultural institutions are under threat right now in terms of funding and what have you. And we in the United States need to think creatively about a rationale for why to protect cultural heritage. We are not just the nice thing on the side. We are the, the essence of who we can be. And we can define spaces of hope that help us to imagine a better future. That's not just the United States. That's globally. And so that's what we're all, I think, trying to do. And we can't do it without the private sector. We can't do it without the multilaterals. So, so beautifully said. Nadia, I had the privilege of seeing your film last night, which I would say was about both saving lives and reasons for living. Yeah. And I just want you to talk for a minute about how that film came to be and why Swarovski, why it, it makes sense for Swarovski to do that. Well, you know, my... Um... Hello? Okay, great. Yeah. No, so water is really important to us, to our manufacturing. And um, also we love nature. We come from an um, environment that's very similar to this. So uh, we made sure our manufacturing was always very environmentally friendly. But we wanted to extend just knowledge about water further. So therefore, we started the first water school 15 years ago in Hohentauern, which is an Austrian national park, um, really supporting the teachers that are teaching the children. And it was such an amazingly impactful program that we thought we should roll it out to countries where water is an issue or other countries where we might have manufacturing plans. So we rolled this program out to um, Africa, South America, Brazil, um, India, China, and even North America, and we see that water has a different topic, whether it's sanitation, pollution, flooding, like in the Mississippi. Um, and we worked with UCLA's um, film school, and they decided to zoom in on women and children and how they interact with the water. And obviously in Africa, it's a major issue, sanitation for girls. That's often the reason why they cannot go to school. Mm -hmm. If they don't get the education, they feel weak, they feel disempowered. So our program really helps them stay at school, stay educated, feel that power. But what's been consistently the same in this program globally is that these girls, and I'm sure you felt that in the film, and we did not expect to see this, is by making them realize that they can be responsible simply by contributing or knowing what the cause is, they can have an impact. I think so often people feel so helpless about having a positive impact on the world, but I think what we're really teaching these kids is that they by themselves can have a positive impact. And to see their pride increase, um, their self-confidence increase by just being uh, guardians, so to speak, of, of, of the earth mm -hmm. has been so fascinating. So we just feel we scratch the surface here and we have to continue. And we're looking for like-minded organizations that are um, active in the same areas. You know, how can we team up? Um, I think you've just answered the question, how can culture empower women? The answer you've all given is by giving them agency, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary. It is a tradition in the Equality Lounge that we do not let badass, amazing, inspiring leaders leave without each telling us something, some pearl of wisdom that you would impart to this group about what it takes to lead um, the, the large and very impactful organizations that you are each leading. So some, some pearl of wisdom about how you got to where you are because you're in a room full of like-minded people who are here because they learn from each other. Okay, so um, we were discussing this earlier, and I think randomness was <laughs> came into came into the beginning of all of our stories. But um, uh, one thing I think is that you've got to be willing to do 
any bit of the job that anybody else does. I mean, I started at Turquoise Mountain as a volunteer the first uh, first year it started up. Yeah. It was started up by, uh, at that point, my boss, now my husband. Um, and I was then a glorified personal assistant, and then I was like a fundraiser, and then I was fixing the computers. I don't remember. At some point, I was the deputy, and then I took over. But by the time I was then running a group of 500 Afghan men, that that's awkward because I was like 28, as you said, uh, and this was a group of 65-year-old Pashtun men. That doesn't work unless they already know that I'm happy to fix the computer and write their budget and whatever else. So there was a sense that you got to be willing to just do any of those things, paid less than you'd like to be paid, and just get on with it, I guess. Yeah. All right, so I, I, um, I did a talk on leadership about two months ago, and I started with the quote that a lot of male CEOs will say, and it's Napoleon's quote, and the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope. And I really do believe that. Like, you have to speak the truth and then, and then look forward. But then I, um, I threw up a photo. I, so I have three kids. They're six, four, and one. So I've got a breast pump back there. So and we were discussing lactating I, before I, the panel. So my youngest daughter has the same haircut as Napoleon. Like, like it's, it's, it, it's, it's, really, it's really funny. And so in a room of, I was speaking to 1,000 um, attorneys about leadership. And in a room of 1,000 attorneys, as a youngish woman, I can't claim young anymore, I threw up a picture of my, at that time, 10-month-old daughter with footy PJs and a messy table, because my life is messy, right? And I said, you know what? Mm -hmm. In addition to defining reality and giving hope, you got to be yourself. You have to be human. You have to let other people see behind the veneer so that they can be themselves and be human. And I, when I think about what I'm most proud of at the Smithsonian, it's not that we're here at the World Economic Forum. It's that I have a team of badass, get shit done women that work with me. We have one guy, just, you know, <laughs> to even things out. Lucky him. Who, lucky him, yes. Who can come to work every day and be themselves and be supported by other women who can be themselves. And, and I think that that's something that we as women are uniquely qualified to model. And so I, I take it upon myself to kind of say, like I, I tell people, I am breast pumping at Davos because it's hard to do that. And it, for the next generation of women to come up to not feel they have to hide that part of themselves. So, so it, it, I think it's the courage to just stop trying to be so perfect and admit when you don't know something and be yourself and not be ashamed of it. Um, I, I think it's the key because people then trust you more. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Let's hear it for breast pumping and really, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want Swarovski crystals on my old breast pump. <laughs> Oh, well, we can definitely, we can sort that out. <laughs> Not a problem. My team did dare me to, like, wear it in yeah. the Congress Center, oh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, the yeah. Hooter Hyder over in C, but Love no, that. I'm not going there. No. Nadia, how, how, how would you say that? I'm particularly struck by your sort of status in your family as the first woman and first woman leader at that level at Swarovski. You know, it, that's, it, it is actually such a tough question, and I have to say I agree with everything that you all said. I think grassroots is so important. You have to know the subject matter in order to excel in it. You have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, I'm half American, half Austrian. Um, I grew up in Austria as a Lutheran person. I was not allowed to attend the Catholic religion class because I'm Lutheran, so I had to leave. I had a one-on-one -on -one with a Lutheran teacher while... My poor friends were taught by the mean Catholic priest, and they were totally tormented. Um, then the teacher, when we were studying history, said to me, oh, Nadia, it's such a shame that you're American because we lost the war because of the Americans. Um, eventually, I went to school in the States, and uh, kids would say to me, I hate you because I'm Jewish. And I would say, no, 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 my American grandfather was top gun in the US Navy, shooting down the most amount of German submarines, awesome. and on and on and on. And I was also ostracized. And there was nothing left but, you know, I couldn't, I mean, I could identify with so many different things, but then again, nothing. Mm -hmm. The only person that's my culture is my sister. Same parents, same issues. And then I just realized, you know what? I'm just going to be myself. What you see is what you get. And if you don't like it, tough luck. Mm -hmm. And I think oh, that God. is what made me be how I am. Yeah. And, you know, especially in Austria, yeah, I talk. I talk more like an American like, than an Austrian. The Austrian women expected not to talk. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had such a wonderful American grandfather. He, we didn't quite know what he did, but he lived in Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> and, yes. yeah. yeah. But, you know, I would say intelligent men are so kind to women because they're not threatened. Yeah. So I'm just used yeah. to intelligent men around me. My father's an engineer, you know. And um, so I'm just talking all the time. And I was included all the time. And... Um, I just was myself all yeah. the time. I love and that. And suddenly, I think maybe that, what you just explained, happened. People probably felt that they could be who they are because I was actually being who I am. Yeah. And people even said to me, oh my gosh, what's your problem? You're always so nice. I'm like, well, why should I be not nice? I am happy to be alive. I feel so fortunate about what we have. And I also feel like in my generation, there were many female leaders that were so harsh, dictatorial, and, you know, I swear to myself, I will never be that kind of leader. For me, it's about empowering people around me and not dictating them what to do. Amazing. And I think we've all seen it, especially in New York City. And that is where I started my career. And there was a certain group of people, which I'm sure you all know. And I swear to myself, <laughs> I, I am not going to flow with that. And that's actually when I thought, no, 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 Swarovski has different values. And I almost... Mm, stated Swarovski's values as actually my values or the other way around. And, you know, I believe in kindness. I believe in collaboration. That is how I was brought up. Um, that's how my parents and their parents treated each other, those Americans and the Austrians. They were so happy that two people that loved each other got together. And I think we can achieve so much more with kindness yeah. and a goal. And the goal is for women or for me, it's not about my power. It's about being in a position of having positive impact. Which is why you're here. Yes, I love that. And that being kind doesn't mean you're not powerful. Exactly. You That's can right. actually Beautifully be said. more powerful yeah. by being totally. kind. Beautifully said. So, yeah. I love and it. That's what we need to be as role models to the next generation. And I think you can get so much more done with kindness and your strength, your knowledge, your intelligence, yeah. you know, and your ethics, working ethics. Here's to more kindness at WEF. I always, it's a tradition in the Equality Lounge to wrap up with the best things that you guys said. Um, Pippa, who I wish was still here, led us off by saying, culture is a form of protection for vulnerable communities. And Molly, you said this beautiful thing that we're all going to be thinking about. Culture contains knowledge. Like, who's, who's you know, processed that one um, enough? Nadia, um, you told us never underestimate the intelligence of the consumer, um, getting more intelligent every day. Molly, you also told us, um, I didn't know this, artisanship is the second most important business in most of the developing world. You both, Shoshana and Molly, told us that tradition bearers are having to leave the places of their traditions um, to, and, and cultural entrepreneurship is bringing them back. One of you, I don't know which one, quoted someone saving, saying after saving people's lives, save their reason for living. And the most important thing you all gave us was the importance of giving others agency. So Nadia, Molly, Shoshana, and Pippa, big thank you. This was great. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs>